I'm Vanessa Tyler. Welcome to Sardar TV. Have you been hacked? Most likely, yes. And if not, you probably will be. How to protect yourself and your company? The answers from cybersecurity expert Maddie Kahn. Maddie, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Vanessa. Uh, very, very interesting topic that we have to delve through. Yes, but let's talk about your journey start. How did you get here? I've actually got into this business, uh, like so many people, by coincidence. I was in the military. In my last year in the military, I had the opportunity to uh, get involved in a position in intelligence that involved a lot of computer work and took several courses. That allowed me, after my um, discharge from the military, to get a job as a young person in, in programming and started to work in uh, programming uh, that was overseas, that was in Israel. I worked uh, for two years in programming and then decided to come to the States to continue my education. Mm -hmm. I uh, came here, I initially worked for um, the government for security for two years. I had a lot of background in security. I was in the military for many years. And uh, after two years of working for security, um, completing my, uh, my undergrad studies, I actually started to work for AIG. Uh, worked on Wall Street for AIG, and after about four or five years, uh, I started my own business. And um, started initially in the world of programming, uh, system integration, and as the business evolved, went where the industry got. And I guess um, security attracted me because of my background in the military. I served for five years in the military. I was an officer in the military. Two more years that I served after the military for the Secret Service. And actually had, if you may say, the inclination and orientation for security together with my knowledge in computers and my background in computers. So I found myself more and more drawn to the issue of uh, cybersecurity. It's got to be cybersecurity. It has to be at the top of very much on the minds of executives. You've worked it should be. It should be. It should be, I would say. It's yeah. unfortunately not always there. I think in many cases it's more in a form of a hype as we off record discussed a bit and more of a hip issue. Uh, but uh, definitely corporate America does not do enough and executives don't do enough uh, for cybersecurity. Unfortunately, mm. In too many cases, people wake up after the event instead of before the event. Very Although true. I think we have gotten better in general. That's very interesting. Everyone's aware of it, but not enough people still are not doing enough about it? Um, you know, the cyber war, as we call it, the cyber security, is a bit like, um, in a sense, we were facing a situation where we, a bit like before 9-11, um, no wood to touch here, but mm. I hope we don't get any cyber 9-11. But before 9-11, we had more than enough signs that it's coming. We had the embassies in Africa. We had the, 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 the U.S. Uh, ship in, in, in Algeria, Morocco. We had other incidents of terrorism. And we always talked about it, and we always talked about security, and we talked about security is necessary, and we have to do security. And we even did airport security, but we really didn't do serious air, airport security. I think nothing better than 9-11 taught us. We didn't do serious airport security. And then came 9-11. Then we really geared up. Um, in a sense, you may say 1941 is the same story with Pearl Harbor. We knew there's a world going on. We knew the tyranny is out there. We knew about the Axis forces. But yet most of us, most of, I think 76% of the people in the country still support ice, being isolated, thinking, you know, out of sight, out of mind, it won't get hurt. And then comes Pearl Harbor, and then we wake up. And it seems it's human nature, organizational nature, um, that it is easier to convince people to take action or easier to take action as a nation when something bad happens. And in the cyber war, we have been talking for a while about the fact that uh, we may have a 9-11 of cybersecurity. And that will wake up the government, the corporate world, everybody together to take a major action. And we have not taken any major action. Everybody's doing their defense uh, things. Uh, you know, they're hacking to us, we're hacking to them. You see, all, you see all those maps that you can see about how much on daily basis the US has, is hit, which areas in the US are hit. There are some rumors about what we do, 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 what they do. There's back and forth accusations. And we play, play the cat and mouse game between hackers and defenders. Uh, and we know in general uh, that the hackers work faster than the defenders, so it's a bit of a losing game on an ongoing basis. But I personally believe that uh, real action, unfortunately, will be taken when something major happens. 
the 9-11 of cybersecurity. That yeah. sounds very frightening. What are we talking about? Banks going down? I don't want to be the, the messenger of the apocalypse. <laughs> that's, that's the last thing that I want to be. And I hope it is not going to be too much of a um, catastrophe, but I hope it will, but it will be probably something that is strong enough to wake us up. But when we are facing cybersecurity issues today, uh, it, it's important to understand that everything is today systems over systems over systems over systems. The whole business of hacking is possible because it's so complex that there are so many points of entry in between systems uh, and nobody has the full picture. So it can be contaminating the water system, it can be shutting down electrical grids, it can be shutting down a hospital, it could be a million and one scenarios that can be played. Uh, that will cause damage, uh, hopefully more commercial damage than human damage. But uh, something, a massive thing needs to be happen in order for us to react. It Amazing. is not something that will just go away, let's put it this way. When you go to companies, what are the top things you tell them about cybersecurity? You go into a company and then what do you do? What do you say? Well, my world as, as an owner of a um, smaller consulting firm. My world is on a smaller scale. I mean, I can talk philosophically with you about the big world, but my personal role is on, on a more of a micro level where I'll talk to a company owner, I'll talk to a CEO, I'll talk to a CTO, and I'll try to make sure that my people implement what is needed on the ground. What's needed on the ground is two things. Number one, ensure to the maximum that you're protected have the proper firewalls in place, the proper malware systems in place, the proper policies and procedures, and more important, one of the most important things is to give the right education to people to beware, because you can apply all the security in the world, and if one person gets an email with a malware and opens it and is not educated not to open it, contaminates the whole system. That happens a lot. That's one front. The second front is, so we deal with one front before you've been penetrated or compromised. And then the second front we have to deal with, okay, now you have been compromised, it happened, let's make sure that your defense strategy or your uh, recourse is in place, if you want to call it, and that means that make sure that you have all the backups in place, all the systems and everything that you need in order to restore your systems as fast as possible. So part of the planning is one defense and at the same time, making sure you have proper backups and not one layer of backup, but multiple layer of backups uh, and a clear plan. What do you do in case you have been compromised? So one stage is before you get compromised, the second stage after you've been compromised. And education is a big part of it. I mean, just like we, the, the nearest comparison we can see is terrorism, uh, we are all used to now see something, say something. That's right. If we would have tried to imply see, see something, say something 20 years ago, and you would have said to somebody, who is this bag, they would tell you, this is none of your business. Today, if you say, who's this bag belong to, somebody say, that's my bag, or somebody will say, oh yeah, who does this belong? Because now we are educated as a public that a bag on the side can be trouble, like we had in the Boston Marathon, where bags were left on the floor. And again, we've learned the hard way. We have not learned, we've talked about it Long, many times before, but until we had that happen, we really have not taken action. Once this happened to us, now we say, see something, say something. The slogan has been out there for a while, but until something really happened where the, the media's done a good job on bringing to everybody's mind what happened, now everybody's paying attention. Yet, as I said, 20 years ago, you would get a very strange reaction if you ask. The question would have been considered strange. Now it's part of the education. So there's a technical part and there's an educational part. I think it's fascinating. Some one person getting an email at your company can compromise your entire system. People can need to communicate with the outside world, okay? And, and they, they, the battle is always, the more you secure the organization, the more you close the organization, the less flexible the people are to do work. There are places, there are some banks that the people don't have emails don't have emails in the bank to contact other people and you have to contact them by calling them or maybe contact them through their personal cell phones already. If you put yourself behind a wall, nobody will penetrate, but you won't see the sunshine also. You can't communicate with the out if you cannot communicate with the outside world, if you can't get a single email from the outside world and everything is closed, then you will not be compromised. But people do need to communicate with the outside world. People in the finance industry, in the service industry, email is a tool of communication. 
uh, mobile phones are a tool of communication, text messages are tools of communication. Thanks God we have some encrypted tools today, but you need to communicate. And all the security is in place and it's enough that you get one message that is contaminated or is poisonous and you open it. And we try to teach people don't open unless you know who sent you that. Mm -hmm. Definitely don't open attachments. Basic stuff, it's really at the micro level. Um, but yeah, one single person can contaminate the whole organization. Clearly you believe it is a war, and if so, who's winning? Ooh. I think it's an important distinction. We talk about cyber war, but the cyber is an instrument of war. We have a war. The tool that is used for the war now is cybersecurity. In World War I we had a war and it was machine guns and trench war. In World War II we had a war that escalated to atomic weapon. This war is escalating to cyber security. But I think people are a bit confused. We're talking about a war. Mm -hmm. Cyber attacks are the new weapon of mass destruction. But it's not the cyber itself that is the issue. The cyber is just the instrument. I mean, if you wouldn't have a war and confrontation with other nations, nobody will deploy cyber war. Cyber war is a weapon. A cyber war, that, that's like calling uh, the atomic war or the, the hydrogen war. It's the cyber, it's, it's a tactic, it's a weapon. It's not a war by itself. The war, we have a war. And we don't want to say that we have a war. And we don't want to admit that we have a war, but we have a war. And the instrument used in the war is technology, cyber security as we call it, cyber war as we call it. But let's just define it, we have a war. We have a war going on, and the instrument used in this war is technology. But people don't like to address the simple fact is that we have a war. And it, people, for some reason, get locked on the cyber security, yeah. the cyber war. But first of all, we have a war. That's like saying World War II was a blitzkrieg war for the Germans started, which we ended up with atomic war. But we never defined the, the Second World War II as the blitz war or the atomic war. These were the instruments of war. Um, this is a war. We have a war going on. And instead of using missiles or rockets, we're using technology. But we have a war. And if we didn't have a war, then we wouldn't have a cyber war. We talk about risk. How at risk are we? Clearly, it seems we are. How at risk is our government? We all like to think that our government is at low risk. How much at risk? It's, it's, it's so hard to sift today with all the media that you're getting and all the information that you're getting. You're getting information from so many places and from so many TV stations. And uh, how much we are at risk, unfortunately, is ciphered to us through political trends, whether it's a right wing or left wing with Democrats or Republican, I'm not taking any position on the matter, but you know, uh, when we have uh, former uh, Secretary of State Clinton accusations with emails and whatever, then there's a big risk there. And when we have about uh, uh, President Trump today, there's a lot of it that the, the Russians hacked him. Um, I, I think the common thing that we see is that we are vulnerable. Uh, we try to claim that we're not, but we are vulnerable. Um, and uh, the level of risk that we are, it's hard to determine because I don't think we really get all the detailed information. I also don't know sometimes what is propaganda and what is reality. Uh, just like when we had the, about a year ago, I believe, or a year and a half ago, we had the famous hacking of the White House, which was blamed on Russians. But none of us ever really, as public, received information. If you had a bomb set, or a missile shot into a city, and the government advertises, we have been attacked, you can see it. You can see, you it. Can see the bomb. You can see the destruction. Uh, when it's cyber war, you really don't see anything. Okay, you see consequences, but the reasons could be 10 reasons. They could be self-inflicted, can be done by somebody else. The Trump admin administration leans the blame towards uh, China as being a major enemy. The President Obama's administration uh, leaned the, 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 the fault more towards the Russian, as if it was, and, and it's important to say, these actually mean to say, the Trump administration says, we are in war with China, and the Obama administration says, we are in war with Russia, because the cyber piece is just the instrument in which we are at war. Yeah. And um, There's no smoking gun, there's no... It, it, no, well, there are some damages. You, you get the WikiLeaks and you get all of a sudden publicities of the emails of uh, former Secretary of State Clinton uh, coming out. Uh, obviously, this is for real. And um, when you get accusation about impacting elections, I mean, 
what is real and real, not real, we don't know. We, we assume from what we know that there was no hacking to the, to the action counting of votes. Uh, the, the accusation is that the releasing of information has impacted the public opinion, and that's how the elections. But obviously, there is something going on. What's the extent of it uh, by the Chinese? We know. By the Chinese, we know that are extensively and openly, also in Chinese publication, talking about experiments that they do on turning down U.S. Inf infrastructure. Wow. The Russians are denying more that they're doing it. And with all fairness, I don't know what we are doing or not. Our government def definitely doesn't tell us. If you go to other countries, and I travel a lot, you will hear in other countries that the U.S. is doing the same to them. Um, so in a sense, all of a sudden, big countries are playing guerrilla cyber war. So, You talked about our government doing it to other people. What about our government doing it to us? What about the encryption debate that's going on between national security and personal privacy? We saw this play out with IFO in the, the bombing, in the situation in San Bernardino, rather. First of all, philosophically, I found it a very interesting debate, the, the debate of, of iPhone versus uh, the FBI. And I think it turned to a bit to, to, to a cockfight between iPhone and, and the FBI, because technically, uh, the FBI, as proven at the end, with some help of private companies, could have done the job. It is more that they wanted to bend the arm of Apple to do the job. Apple had its position that they don't want to give it away. Right. But it seems that they didn't need Apple's help. And the <laughs> fact that they didn't need Apple's help pretty much answers the question that they can do pretty much anything that they want. I read an article about uh, two weeks ago, I think it was in New York Post, about the whole revelation of the CIA's latest um, instruments of, of spying, which include, amongst other, their ability to turn on a smart TV in your house without you even knowing it and using it as a recording device to what goes in your home. Mm -hmm. They can remotely control any phone, whether it's an iPhone or an ad Android-based phone. Uh, so I think we have very sophisticated um, government and very sophisticated secret services and they have very sophisticated technology and thanks God that they have it. We should have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and how much do they use it internally? I hope they use it only to find uh, harming elements within society, whether it's criminal elements or with, uh, with terrorism. Uh, but the problem is almost that that's a philosophical issue. It's not so much a technology issue, but there's all that when, when you have the capabilities, where is the stopwatch on making sure how far does the government use these capabilities? But I think everybody should know the government has the capability. You can really not hide much. Uh, design, implement, and analyze an organization's information security policies. I, we touched a bit on it before. I mean, really, an organization has to first protect itself have in place all the firewalls, firewalls has to have all the, the malware, the antiviruses and all the various softwares that are made out there. Organizations should have penetration tests done on periodic basis. These are tests to see. It's like in a military situation where you test your own defense systems. And the organization should have policies and procedures to employees, what they should or should not do, what is allowed and not allowed to understand what transactions they take that may put the organization or themselves at risk. And of course, the, they should have plan B, what happens if they have been compromised. Um, the, there, there is a damage that organizations suffer when they have been compromised. Just from the fact that they go ahead and admit that they have been compromised, there's a tremendous psychological impact on their clients, on their vendors, on whoever you do business. If you do business with a financial organization, if you run your portfolio, and you hear they have been compromised, even if you hear that they took care of the problem, so your instinct may be, maybe I'll go to another company. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, small businesses that have been severely compromised from a, with cyber attacks, um, I think 75% of them go out of business within a year after that. Simply because their reputation has been ruined? Uh, yeah, their reputation is really something that's very hard to fix. Their reputation is really hard to fix. Nobody wants to work with a company that uh, cannot control its security. Though pretty much everybody is exposed to the same risk. Uh, there are companies who 
maybe don't pay attention at the lower level. The higher you go in the, in the hierarchy of the corporations, the bigger corporations are more and more protected. Um, there is now a whole component also of regulations involved. So it's no longer so much of a choice. Mm -hmm. Today, in order to do business with companies, uh, I know as a smaller company, when I do business with the bigger organizations, uh, for both for insurance purposes, uh, from a risk management purpose, they do ask you, what do you use? What security you use? What are your security mm -hmm. policies? We're becoming very regulated. It doesn't make it easier for the smaller companies, but it's no longer a matter of your choice. So there is a regulatory component, but we also know that the regulatory component doesn't always make people do the right things. They m makes them provide the right answers, but not always <laughs> or take all the right actions. I would the think, especially if they, you have customer information, whether it's a social security number or even a date of birth, you don't really necessarily have to protect that. As it must be protected. There are regulations about how these protect. I mean, we had an incident, what was it, about two years ago, three years ago, that the, the whole slew of, uh, of tens of thousands of IRS records were stolen. And with that, the uh, people's names, the addresses, all the bank information, all their records, all their W-2s, uh, any financial transaction they did, all included in those tax returns, these were stolen from the government. And once in a while, we endlessly hear about credit card theft. And the, the sad thing for, 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 this, for the smaller guy out there is that you, me, um, us people on the street, we have no ability to protect ourselves from this. Why? Because it is, you can take your home computer and put a great antivirus on it. You can always shut it off the moment you stop using it. You can close your router and do everything. But you bank with a bank. And you have a, your insurance policy with an insurance company. And uh, when you bank with the bank, they have your records. And when you deal with the government, they have your records. And you deal with an insurance company, they have your record. And if you have a financial company that, that runs your portfolio, they have your records. It is them that are being compromised at your expense at my expense. And uh, I have not seen yet, there is a tendency immediately to try and compensate the small guy, quote unquote, if I may say. So if, you, if, if there's money being stolen from a credit card, yes, the, the banks right away will cover that. So the monetary damages will be covered. But what do you do when your identity has been stolen? What do you do when such theft ends up in identity theft? The second stage, first steal the information, then it's been sold to, to a second layer of people somewhere who now start an identity theft. Uh, people who are subject to identity theft, it's, it's the most horrific thing in the world because uh, you go there to and, and you explain, this is not my mortgage, this doesn't belong to me, and everybody will nod and say they understand you. But it takes years to discharge you. It takes years to rebuild your credit. So who... When, when your records have been stolen as a result of a bank or institution losing it, mm -hmm. then a second generation of somebody who gets the stolen information initiated a, an identity theft, and here you are at the end of it two years later, all of a sudden your world collapses on you and everybody you know, is very sympathetic to you. But nobody, you still have to go to the judicial, judicial systems, to the court systems, it takes years. You can't yeah. apply for a job because every time you apply for a job, your credit is destroyed. You can't run through the layers of human secure, human resources departments and say, hey, 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 it wasn't me. Wow. So you're being stonewalled. I mean, it, who picks up that damage? And there are millions of people in the United States who are in this position. Yeah, like people who lost their income, people who went ba real bankrupt, wow. people who lost their income, people who became homeless of these situations. And the system really doesn't provide any good answers to doing that. And I personally think that the corporations and the government are not being held accountable enough to situations. But the corporations and governments are those who are setting the regulations. So that's pretty much letting the prisoners watch the asylum to ask them to put the regulation to protect yeah. us when Lock they the are door. the one. <laughs> but that's a little bit beyond yeah. Yeah. the context that we're talking about. Assess the security vulnerabilities of an organization's networks against cyber adversaries. You've been talking about this. Obviously, the adversaries out there can just really get into a, co a company's network. Unfortunately, for whatever reasons, the adversaries are much more motivated. They are much faster. It's important to say something. The business of hacking actually started as something very good. The original, original hackers were really the quote-unquote nerds or the real brilliant system guys who saw this development and were concerned that there may be glitches. 
and they actually hacked, and their pleasure was to highlight and point out to organizations, look, pay attention to this, we can get in here, we can get in there. That was really a good movement. That was actually a somewhat, if you want, a quality control to rapidly developing systems out there. Soon after that came the greed, came the money, came the opportunities. So, and um, we had a variety and have a variety of different types of hackers. I'm talking about the commercial basis, not at the national level. We have a national level, we have national security, we have hacker groups that are being uh, driven and paid for by governments, that's one thing. But we have on the private level, uh, first it started with people who just uh, enjoy hurting. And they take pleasure in hurting. It became, then it moved to identity theft, to people who like hacking to your computer, steal everything and just make money out of it. These are nothing but modern day crooks and thieves. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got the, the ransom softwares. They were very popular in 2016, basically a virus hits your machine, you get a message and tells you that X amount of files in your company, hundreds of them, most of the files have been contaminated and we are holding the antivirus and you got 48 hours to pay us and when you pay us we send you the antivi antivirus, these are called ransom viruses and we basically had 48 hours to pay and the word is pay because if you don't pay within 48 hours it will dis be destroyed. And, um, and companies have been paying this? Oh yeah. oh yeah, I was involved in two cases where we've actually paid, got the antivirus and working like crazy to restore all the files. You basically have to rescan the files to that key, we call it. You get a key to uncontaminate the files in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, These are called ransom viruses. We're very popular through 2015 and 2016. And so they just stopped? Uh, or no, they, they, they're still going on. The level of crime is advancing. We started with simple identity thefts. We moved to ransom viruses. And we even had moral base attacks. If you remember the famous case of uh, uh, two years ago, a year and a half of Ashley Madison. Yes. Ashley Madison. The cheaters. The, <laughs> cheat, the, cheat, the quote unquote cheater site yes. uh, was, uh, was, was, was compromised. Yeah. And basically what the attackers wanted is you shut it down because it's immoral. If you don't shut it down, then they will do something much more immoral and they'll destroy a lot of people's lives. Release uh, the which they, yeah, and Release the name, which they did. And, uh, you know, it ended up in people committing suicide mm -hmm. in, in the destruction of families. Uh, it's not a joke. I mean, so once this, this hole is created, you have all kind of people who crawl through that hole, from thieves, to, to God lovers, to national security issues. Um, you know, there's an old saying in the Old Testament, where there's, where there's a hole, there'll be a thief, and we have thieves. What are some of the cybersecurity professional ethics? I think that the term professional ethics and cybersecurity is, is a great oxymoron. What ethics is there in, in cybersecurity uh, when we talk about people who violate cybersecurity, people who invade your systems, people who steal? people who uh, work to hurt you, whether it's on the national security level, whether it's in a personal level, whether it's in the bank level, whether it's in a financial level. I'm not a great believer that there's honor between thieves, if that's the question. We talked about we have a strong regulatory component that's coming into cybersecurity from the side of the, if you want to call it the good people and the bad people, on yeah. the side of the organization, the private people, people who are innocent, who are subject to these attacks, and we're being requested more and more to follow these regulatory components. In the past, when it started, you know, you had an option to buy an antivirus. Today, every computer comes with its antivirus. Yeah, uh, companies today, in order to get your insurance, your liability insurance, you must have a whole set, uh, follow a whole set of procedures of cybersecurity in terms of protections, what you need, and they do a very good job today. There are audits to make sure you have all those things. So, so there's a whole regulatory component, a growing one, on day, day by day, of what to do to defend yourself. But on the side of the attacks, attackers, I, I don't see any honor between thieves and definitely don't see any ethics there. How should a CTO effectively manage a business information continuity plan? Uh, you know, there's, there's two components. You've got to do, deploy all, all that you need to prevent it from happening. You've got to everything in place in case it happens. And not only from a systems point of view, but also from a PR point of view. Because as I said, the, the reputation damage of a company that has been compromised is most of the time bigger than the actual system damage. To the point that companies sometimes 
will try to hide and not dis disclose that it happened to them. They'd rather bite the losses and find another reason than going out publicly and saying they shouldn't, it's illegal, but out there and saying we've been compromised. It's a, uh, I don't want to give analogies from personal life. You can think about people, mm -hmm. but what a person admits and then how people look at them. But uh, yeah. it is very similar. You know, yes. you don't want to deal with somebody who's been compromised. What are some of the challenges um, businesses are likely to face and how should they handle them? Please share an example. The challenge is compromising a business. That is the challenge. I mean, the challenge is what does a businessman or, comp or, or an owner of every company is concerned about with a small firm or a huge firm? Concerned with protecting the integrity of the organization. Many of those cyber attacks are aimed towards really bridging the integrity of your organization. So if you are a bank, if your uh, clients are repetitively uh, being compromised, um, you will go to another bank. If you are a systems company, we know Yahoo took such major hits that their valuation went bust because they've been constantly uh, cases of, 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 of compromising email accounts. Last, I think the last batch was five million accounts of Yahoo that have been compromised. So the, this is something that happens. As doing business, you want to protect what you do. You want to protect your client list. You want to protect your relationship that you have with people. You want to protect your financial records. Everybody has, if you're in a hospital, you want to protect your patient information. Everybody has what their Achilles heel is, what is their main business driver or the main organizational driver. And hacking is meant to destroy those things, yeah. you know, whether for financial reasons, uh, sometimes just for the purpose of malice. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of people who just you no, know, that's probably something psychiatrists can go and find out, but a lot of people out there just enjoy the malice of the action. What are some of the foundational elements of a strong information risk management framework? Um, and can you elaborate on them? A strong risk management for IT is really a plan that takes every, or you can never take all, but takes as many risks, possibilities into consideration and has a plan how to deal with each of those risks, okay? Mm -hmm. So a strong plan will have, and once again, we will have the how to prevent and multiple scenarios how to prevent, very well documented, very well implemented, monitored on an ongoing basis, and informative internally to all its employees and participants, and a very good plan of what to do in case it has been bridged. Now bridging, it doesn't have to be that it's all or nothing. Bridging can also happen in layers, just like, you know, just think of a battlefield. I mean, you can lose the first line, the second line, and the third line. And uh, we call it um, um, def depth in defense, is where you have circles, where, you know, you, you have a first round that can be compromised, it will cause some minimal damage, but it will give you the alarm. And then you have a second circle and a third circle. You want to right away bridge something Okay, so you create multiple layers of security. So the offenders, the intruders have to first break the first layer, then the second layer, then the third layer. And, and I talk in very generic terms here because to go into specifying routers and, 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 and servers and DMZ servers and all this will just confuse the listeners. So I'm trying to draw it as a picture that we have all the technology behind it to do it, but really creating a depth and defense in which you have one circle, second circuit, a third circle of defense and you know when your first has been violated you know then you already have to put in action X amount of things because now your second layer is at risk if God forbid that has been violated what do you do and what are the internal mechanisms that you start now deploying in terms of maybe closing certain system preventing some information and everything done in concert and when those things are really laid well and planned it's very hard to penetrate what are some of the immediate steps to take in wake of a cyber attack? Like you mentioned, if they enter the perimeter, what should we do? Well, that's the definition, what is the perimeter? Um, you know, a lot of people talk today about uh, creating similar situations that we had in the big scare of the Cold War. If you remember, during the Cold War, we had silos, right? We, everybody built silos in the backyard. They buried them underground. They loaded the silos with food and supplies for X amounts of months and water supply and so on. Um, we had a second um, um, alarm like this around Y2K, if you recall. 
and why 2 kcom and the whole conversion and this whole doomsday scenarios of all system collapsing comes uh, January 1, 2000. Um, then, um, you know, there were a lot of people also were accumulating water on the side, doing all kind of preparation that if there's a shortage or a system freeze and credit companies don't work and you cannot buy goods and, and water and food, have, be ready. I'm a bit personally a little bit scared giving such recommendation, uh, but, but there are people who do that. There are people who do that. Um, uh, I remember in New York, when was it, uh, I think it was October 2003, we had the blackout, mm -hmm. the famous blackout, and uh, the two most, uh, the two greatest commodity by, uh, by the next day, by 10 o'clock in the morning, and, and the blackout started to fade away by around, the, in areas in Manhattan, by 12 noon already. So we really were talking from 4 o'clock, I think, on the Friday afternoon till 12 day midday, so we didn't even have 20, hour, 20 hours we had on this, okay? But I can tell you next morning, uh, I had money, I had cash and I had uh, water at home and I was handing to different friends bottles of water and cash. Uh, and that's in, in a 20 hour span yeah. because nobody has cash, we all rely on ATM. Nobody right. accumulates water, you can buy them in every corner. But what happens when you don't have cash being the, and your credit cards don't work and you can't purchase water, um, so there are people who advocate today for uh, prepare yourself, have a little storage ready in case things happen. Maybe that's the right thing to do. I'm, I'm personally a little bit leery yet to give such recommendations. Maybe I should, but uh, uh, some people do it. Organizations uh, prepare um, what's called cold sites and warm sites, alternative sites for operation. Kenta Fitzgerald in 9-11, which was a company that suffered terribly from the attack, yeah. had a whole uh, site in New Jersey ready for them that allowed them to operate immediately as a backup site. They actually had the people go to another place, they had trading systems there, everything backed up due to a CTO who was very fanatic on having this backup who everybody viewed potentially as a lunatic for doing all this preparation. God know it became very handy. Yeah. So for organizations to have backup operational plans, but that part of that plan that I talked about, in case all their systems compromise, alternative systems to, to use, that's important. On a personal basis, if you hit, uh, if, if, if your water grid got hit, if your electrical get, grid got hit, then it's really going to boil down to, to the ABCs of life. Make sure you have water and supplies ready on the side. I don't know if it makes sense, and I definitely don't want to be, as I said, I, I don't, I, I don't want to see, sit on the, on the <laughs> a, 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 apocalyptic horse, yeah. but uh, these risks do exist. Please give us some cyber security tips for small businesses. I know we talked a lot about larger companies. Um, just a small business, I have just maybe a little dress shop. A small business, it's, it's a simple process that should be followed. A small business should not underestimate the risk. They should not underestimate what can happen to them if they're compromised. They should first of all have a professional come on site. Okay, whether it's a professional from a company like ours, Infotech, whether it's a professional from any appropriate and reputable consulting firm, make sure that the basic is in place. For a small business, it does, it, it, is, an, it is an expense, but comparing to the risk, it is not a big expense. Make sure your firewall's in place, make sure your malware's in place, make sure you run a little training program for your employees to know what they should avoid. Basic stuff to make sure, basically yeah. make sure your inventory is protected, make sure your computer, make sure that your accounting system cannot be hacked, making sure that your CRM system cannot be hacked. Make sure that basic things are in place, you know. Small businesses, small problem, big businesses, big problems. But if you take care of it at the basic level, then you can really prevent the risk. How can organizations develop and articulate effective enterprise information security policies that address internal and external national and international threats. They should hire help. They should hire help. Unless they have internally somebody who really knows it, hire the help, either on a permanent basis, either depending on the size of your organization. You're a big organization, you're going to have your own people. You're a small organization, you can hire people on a consultancy basis to set it up and then visit it once in a while. You don't have to keep the people forever. But hire some help, make sure you're being taught about the risk. Many people tend to underestimate the risk. You know, it is no different than doing your uh, annual checkup. 
you know, 30 years ago, an annual checkup was, what are you talking about today? We all know we're going to do our annual checkup. Mm -hmm. The same with systems. Yeah. You know, make sure things are in place. Make sure you have an annual checkup. Make sure that some tests are done. Make sure somebody, as you, as we all, especially in smaller businesses, people get engulfed in so many things and you are constantly chasing your tail, constantly being jack of a thousand trades when you're running a smaller mm -hmm. businesses. And, uh, you know, you, you deal only with what hurts. Uh, but have somebody deal with that because when that hurts, it may be, it may be one of those situations that you can't just easily fix if you get hurt on them. Many of us love public Wi-Fi, yes. but are we sacrificing privacy? Yes. <laughs> Simple answer is yes, we are. Um, I, I was interviewed uh, about I think about a year, year and a half ago when all those kiosks started appearing in New York City. Uh, once you get on the Wi-Fi, you have access uh, and that mechanism has access back to you. Um, the companies who publish and put those with, with all the credit due to them, they make all the disclosures and statements that they do not infringe on your privacy, they do not look back into your phone, they do not check information back in your phone. But let me be clear, from a technological point of view, it is possible to do. So you are relying on a promise that it will not be done. Uh, and that's a matter of personal philosophy. I believe that uh, um, it's not a good idea to open yourself where you don't have to open yourself. Um, I don't want to take anything away from those public uh, Wi-Fi's. I usually just like to buy my, uh, my time directly from the phone company and not go go to any local Wi-Fi. So you're not at the Starbucks using Wi-Fi? I am the not using the Wi-Fi personally at a Starbucks. I'm not saying that, God forbid, Starbucks is doing anything wrong. And I'm sure that most of those places are purely good and just putting the Wi-Fi there. But, um, you know, when you have this uh, big New York City Wi-Fi out there, I'm always leery. I travel a lot. And in the airports, you get all those Wi-Fi's. Uh, and you have to answer some questions to your Wi-Fi. And you have to register. They really capture your phone there. And uh, once they do that, at any point, they can go back into your phone to extract information relatively in an easy way. And uh, so I'm no fan of that. That's a matter, by the way, preferential and personal taste. Uh, some people may argue this is an irrelevant concern and uh, uh, we can't close ourselves to that level. Uh, but I, I think I, I'm, I'm able to manage without using the big Wi-Fi spot locations. I, I'm, I'm sitting in a restaurant and having dinner, I will use the restaurant's Wi-Fi. I will do that. I have no problem with that. But uh, if I go to airports, I try as much as I can, sometimes I have no choice, to avoid the airport's uh, Wi-Fi. I try to avoid the big New York City Wi-Fi's. I try to avoid the big Wi-Fi in the European cities. They're a great tool to collect information about my phone, capture information from my phone. One can argue what is so important on my phone. Well, it's important to me. <laughs> you know. So no, you are at risk because uh, you're open and um, it's a matter of personal. You can say, how much risk am I at? Because for me, it's also not absolute. As I said, I'll go to a restaurant, I'll use the restaurant's Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. okay? I stay at certain hotels, I do use the Wi-Fi of these hotels. But when it goes to bigger entity Wi-Fi's, it's a matter of personal taste. I'm usually a bit more if I can avoid it, maybe it's a superstitious thing. Uh, I just know that the technology enables them. And we know this businesses, and this is done by businesses, and cash flow is a driver. And we've all lived to situations where, you know, give us your information, it will be only used by us. And uh, five years later, you found that your list has been sold to some marketing company with your favorite purchasing habits. Yeah. And uh, good luck going chasing them after that, you know. And uh, so this is. Again, information somebody accumulates that uh, maybe the circumstances will be later that they need to sell it. Maybe the circumstances will change later. Um, if I can avoid it, I will avoid it. What are uh, common cyber threats to mobile phone and data? Pretty much the same as they are to your regular uh, yeah. systems. Though it's important to understand that today mobile phones are used more than desktops. You see, mobile phones came out first. We were talking about 5%, 3% usage. Corporations didn't even take it seriously. Today, more than 50% of corporate's IT budget is geared towards mobile phones. Everything is done on the mobile phone. It's no longer a mobile phone. I mean, what, what Apple brought to the picture, what, what Steve Jobs brought to the world, uh, which crashed Nokia at the time, was he did not look at this device as a phone. 
He looked at it as a computer, as an entertainment device, also a phone, as opposed to everybody else. And Philip Pohn looked at it as a phone. Yeah, you can do some Pac-Man and some little games. But what he brought, he brought a computer, an entertainment device. I mean, I pick up that phone, and whether I happen to have an iPhone here or whether an Android, and I can do every email program, my Word document, my Excel documents, my PDF. I can do, do my banking here. Uh, I can browse the wow. internet. I use text messaging. I use encrypted text uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, this is more convenient than a desktop, more convenient than a laptop, you know? And uh, so the risks here are even bigger than on anything else. Um, there's technologies to swipe your phones. There's technologies to copy your phones. Uh, you should try to use, uh, uh, people tend to store things on, um, on contact lists. I would say, whenever you have a phone, don't store anything on your contact list that is important. They tend to tend to tend, people tend to store their passwords on, on their contact. They, they make a contact called password and store their phone information there. So go to the section of your phone that has notes. Store it in your notes and secure the notes with an internal password. Little things like this that in terms of how to operate your iPhone or your Android device or your Google phone in the most efficient manner. Okay. But this is a wonderful device. I mean, these devices changed our life. Some can argue philosophically that they destroyed our life. But, uh, you know, I still remember working and going to lunch and I had a, a, one of the five guys from the IT group who would have a beeper and all the other four wouldn't have. And you went to lunch for an hour and a half and you didn't hear from anybody for an hour and a half. And you went back to the office and checked your voicemail. Did anybody call me? I don't think anybody even checks voice message today. You know, it's all here. If somebody called you, it will show up as a text. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now we are wired um, with a nice infusion all the time. 24 hours. 24 hours, and this is risky as it gets, no different than any desktop device, probably more than desktop devices. Um, and again, and for these devices also, there's a variety of security devices that have been installed. Some phones have uh, more security, some phones have less. You can buy more security. Um, little advice off the cuff, if we're talking about little tips, don't use text messaging. Use uh, encrypted messaging systems. Um, WhatsApp is something we're all familiar with, Viber, any, and there's a, there's a variety of them. Yeah. Use encrypted messaging um, just for the audience to know the basic difference between an encrypted message and a text message is a text message, is you write it and send it, and all along the way that text message as is can be picked up in every cell tower. When you write an encrypted message, you see it and you send it, and the next time this message is being seen is when it's opened on the other phone. Along the way, you cannot pick up anything. Well, so and how does one get that? Oh, you download them. They are all free to download, and they are easy to use. Every text message, and uh, I, I, every time that I communicate with somebody in text message, I always try to convince them. I happen to use WhatsApp. I'm not making any commercial WhatsApp, but mm -hmm. Viber is as good as WhatsApp, and a whole variety of encrypted uh, text text messaging tools. Uh, but uh, try to go to as many tools that are encrypted and secured as opposed to non-secure tools. Social media, <laughs> a hacker's favorite target area for personal uh, cyber attacks. Yeah. Um, what kind of attacks uh, do hackers use most often on social media? And what measures should we use to protect ourselves from these attacks? Well, social media, the biggest target for social media are children and younger people. Mm. And I have four kids and it's a horrifying thought. My 10-year-old uh, has his own YouTube channel, and uh, he's able to accumulate more, more viewers than I'm able to accumulate on my company. I mean, he accumulated in two weeks like 4,900 viewers, okay, for a 10-year-old kid who set up his own YouTube channel. Mm. And it's a whole different generational gap because if you watch those clips, and I admire my son, um, I would never come to my mind to make such a clip or think that anybody's going to watch it. But they're basically recording their lives. They're recording what they're doing. They're recording wow, where yeah, they're going. Yeah, it's a reality show. Or? It's it's like a lot of little reality shows, <laughs> and, and the, the other kids love it, and they get ton, tons of views. Uh, but you don't know who's on the other line. No. I'm always horrified. I'm horrified of. Uh, Criminals, I'm horrified of pedophilers, I'm horrified yeah. of no shortage of people that present themselves who they are not. Uh, I'm horrified of all kind of freaks, excuse the language, that like to hook up with kids. And, uh, and I, as deep as I am into this field, don't know how to protect my son from that. I have requested he shares the information with me and that I, we try to stay on top of it, 
but you really have no, he has a phone and he has a text and he has a Facebook and he knows how to use those tools probably better than I know. He really swims in every game and every maneuver and minutia that can happen over there. And uh, this is one of our biggest concerns. Um, if you remember when Pokemon Go came out, there were several criminal incidents of yes. criminals setting up locations, because you can set up your own location, That's right. luring people there and hurting kids. Uh, it's a scary thought. I mean, for me, social media, the, the, the biggest enemy and the biggest victims are always the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard about uh, sex scandals. We've heard about uh, little kids, girls, kidnapping, tons of things. And that is a scary, scary thought. And I know law enforcement are doing all kinds of operations on periodic basis. We see this also on kind of all kinds of reality shows to, to prevent those things and ambush such people. Yeah. But, man, we are... We are so exposed. We give the kids these phones because everybody in the class get the phone. Uh, we give them these tools. Uh, there are parental tools that you can monitor, but those parental tools, how, how much can you monitor when, when your kid sits there for hours and works at the speed? You don't have the time to monitor everything. And when he says, oh, that's my friend, and you feel like saying, well, have you seen this friend? No, we hooked up over this. Uh, they not only hook up to social media, they hook up to game, uh, uh, to Pokemon, whatever, wow. which now they play in groups, uh, car racing that they do in groups. Uh, I go and see my, my, my other son plays car racing, and he's, got, he's competing with somebody in Saudi Arabia and in Hong Kong and in China and whatever. And these are all supposedly other kids. Uh, but I don't know if those are other kids. You know, and um, me personally, uh, children and youth is the biggest scare, scare about social media. Yeah. Uh, you, have, uh, you have dating. Dating is a big thing on social media. But they've they gotten better. I think the dating sites now connect to your Facebook. They actually require you. And so the person can actually see a lot about your life and friends. So this is, a, by the way, a great mechanism that the dating sites have implemented. At the beginning, you just go put your name and say whoever you are, put whatever picture. Now they require some confirmations. A Facebook site or something that, something prior to that, you can't come out of the blue and go on the dating site. And I bless them for that, that these are great things that they've been doing. On all the other th stuff that we spoke before applies to social media, but with the difference that social media has is really the entry to the youth, to the children. And anybody who has children should be afraid. I know that I'm afraid. I'm always worried. Yeah. I'm always, always worried. I always ask my son, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? Who are you communicating to? And sometimes the fear is he will not tell me because that is not cool and that doesn't understand his relationship with someone and that is square and that doesn't get it, you know? And that's amazing. And you're like the most renowned uh, cyber security expert. But yeah, that, yeah but, that, but that is not cool. That is <laughs> never cool. And my dad wasn't cool. I don't know. The other, when you were a little girl playing with your friends, your dad was cool. But we are not cool as parents yeah. and we don't get it. And we're just hysterical and afraid. We don't get it. We, we don't get it until, God forbid, something happens. But this is kids. Um, I think that's the biggest fear that we have today on cybersecurity. I mean, and I, I think I, I know effort has been put to stop it. I think much more effort should be put to stop it, and uh, hopefully more and more mechanisms to protect will come out. But that is really one of the, one of the things that keeps me up at night is definitely that fear. Can you share any more effective cyber parenting tools other than asking, like you said, hey, who are you speaking with, especially when you're they're doing these joint games. Well, well most, of the, most applications today come with parental control features. And those parental control features, you can, uh, you can set them up from mild to heavy in terms of really ma making sure you monitor every transaction of the kids. Uh, you can also, if you give a kid a phone or a, uh, or a desktop, you can limit who they have access to or not. You can also limit access to certain applications. You can limit also access to sites you don't want kids to go to, such as uh, uh, X-rated uh, sites that you don't want your kids to, to go on to. And companies are coming constantly up with uh, all kinds of software. Um, the problem that is with that software is a, pra is a practical problem. Uh, you go to work. Uh, you come back from work, you, you attend to the house, you do whatever you need to do, as I'm sure you do. Uh, I go to work, I come back, I have to make phone calls, I have to catch up. Um, my kid has been with his phone, even though he shouldn't take it to school, he probably has it in his pocket and pulls it out during break time and probably spends six, seven hours on the phone. Now, I need to track him down. I need six, seven hours to really track, <laughs> track down, down what he did. Um, so the other option is to block him from doing certain things. Um, 
they are smart. They outsmart us, the kids. I've learned it firsthand about how a 10-year-old outsmarts me. When they outsmart, they have a great network between them, how to outsmart the parents on these things. And they don't do it because they're bad kids. They just do it because they want to be good kids. But, you know, as I said before, we're not cool and we don't understand the world. And they will show us. And we, we that have seen the darker sides of life and have been exposed to the darker sides of life and have learned about some of the horrible things that can happen, saying, no, 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 you don't understand. And, you know, I, I get all the deers and the headlights from my son when I try to tell him he, he doesn't understand because he's convinced that I'm the one who doesn't understand and that's going back a thousand years, nothing to do with cybersecurity. That <laughs> has always been the case. Um, so we can just try to stay on top of it, have yeah. good relationship with our kids, use parental tools wherever we can on those systems. And also I recommend to limit kids' time on those uh, systems, not to allow some parents. It, it became convenient for parents to let the kids be on those social media because um, the, the, the scary part is that when you were a kid and you didn't know something, you turned around and said, Mom, Dad, what is this? What is that? They don't ask you these questions today. No. And on the contrary, they'll explain it to you better because they'll jump into the phone, to Wikipedia, to, 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 to side chats, and they will tell you. I remember my, I have four boys, my older boy is in, uh, in, at the university today, but, but he used to ask me a lot of questions, okay? My five year still asks me a lot of questions, but I know I'm running out of time there because soon he discovers, like my 10 year old, that there is an internet and it answers much faster than dead and it provides answers much faster than dead. And uh, so, so, so these, uh, these tools have taken, uh, became, became a, have stolen some of the parenting roles. Yeah. And with parenting roles comes respect. So the respect goes more towards those systems than it goes to the parents. And then you want to come as a parent and tell them to turn off those systems. That's more of a psychological issue than a cyber issue, but it's an issue. But to, wow. to concentrate on your question is to try to deploy as many parental in, uh, tools that are provided by the software companies, uh, try to talk to your kids as much as you can, and limit the usage of time that they have on these systems. Well, the Internet of Things, which we talked about, yep. leaves us very vulnerable. Oh, yeah. uh, how likely will our personal devices get hacked? Cybersecurity has become much more expanded than, than the firewall that we deal with and the malware and what we've discussed so far. Uh, we have today machine-to-machine -machine cybersecurity, and we have the IoT, the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is basically uh, can now, on a corporate network, represent up to 20 or 30 percent of the devices on the network, but, the internet, the, but these Internet of Things, um, they are not protected yet. They don't have the proper protections in many cases. They're just being brought into the picture. It's a software that on your iPad that allows you to control the air condition at home, and yet that iPad is control connected to your workplace. If it is um, the very scary scenario of um, um, pacemakers. Okay, today, when somebody's pacemaker goes bad, unfortunately, we know about it when they, when, when they start feeling bad and pressing the panic button. But we have now sophisticated pacemakers that you actually have a tracking device on the pacemaker, and you can control the pacemaker remotely. So if somebody feels bad, that pops up in the monitor and control. You no longer fall and crash. They can actually fix you. But they can also shut you down. So imagine a situation where a hacker takes control of a center with pacemakers. And I'm not saying this exists right now. The technology to be there exists. I don't want to scare any of you. It can happen. It can happen. I don't want to scare any, any audience that now this will happen tomorrow. But I'm talking about a hypothetical scenario. That's clear, hypothetical scenario, in which uh, a hacker takes over of a pacemaker, and you get a phone call that tells you that you have one hour to make a payment, or your loved one down in the south wants, will, will cease existing. Hasn't happened yet, but the technology to go to this extreme will happen. I don't think we are there yet. I hope this will never happen. But the Internet of this is an extreme case of Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is now becoming everything. We moved. We are now connecting everything. We're connecting your phone, your pacemaker, uh, your watch. Everything is now connected to the Internet. Mm -hmm. All these present a whole new slew of uh, openings into the systems. Uh, and then we have machines learning machines. Okay, and that's where machines detecting the patterns of your machine. 
uh, they're surfing, they're surfing the internet, they're surfing IPs, they're surfing your systems, they, they, they're surfing constantly, endlessly looping uh, for vulnerabilities on your system. Uh, we have an issue. Is changing our old passwords frequently enough to protect ourselves from email hackers, is that enough to do it? And if not, what are some of the more effective ways to protect our email and social media accounts from getting hacked? First of all, changing your password frequently is a great thing to do, okay? There's, not, there's never enough that you can do, you can always do more, but I'll tell you, that is a basic thing that most people don't do. Worse so, people are being told to put complicated passwords on the system. A year or two ago when Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of uh, Facebook, was hacked and it turned out that his password for three or four of his systems was like blah 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 or something like this, two simple words. So, so here we have the, had the shoemaker go barefoot, you know, to, telling us all how it should be and then he's using a few. Because the truth is, you know, we work fast on the system, we don't have the patience to type something wrong. So yeah, we tell everybody, but I'll just do it like this. No, changing your password is a good idea. Changing your password on a scheduled basis is a good idea. Keeping your password long and tiring to type is a good idea. Um, making sure your changes are not systematic, which means don't do... Um, uh, Vanessa 01 for January, Vanessa 02 mm -hmm. for February, and Vanessa 03 for March, yeah. which a lot of people do, and it takes every hacker a second to figure out. Avoid using birthdays of your children, your loved one, your married date, your anniversary dates. Um, every typical, What's left? Well, every <laughs> typical hacker sits on those and runs through the gamut. All they have to do is obtain your personal information, which they found already some identity theft, and then they just say, okay, let me pick up all the data. It's going to be one of them. What's left? A little imagination, combination. Use combination. Use a password that combines maybe your anniversary date with the birth of your kids. Maybe use a password that combines the name of your, your, with your spouse with, with, the, with, with, with your premarital name. And, and put a note for yourself somewhere under a protected uh, a, um, note, as I said, oh, I always write down, you have to write down, because we have so many systems, yeah. we have so many passwords, and we can't keep track. So, so, so keeping that list in a secure place is a good idea because our memory fades very fast. Uh, <laughs> but not to use, very changing true. frequently, and changing to complicated names, avoiding using your anniversaries, your birth date, the things that we all know is a great step. That, that will block 95% of your hacking, 97% of your hacking. Are we are particularly at risk at ATMs? Um, I was just reading something not too long ago about uh, banks using um, cardless ATMs. But is that a big risk? I mean, we, we know about some of the machines they may put in there, but... About, uh, I think about three months ago, it showed up in Europe, maybe it came up, it was an, an amazing scam where people put uh, on top of the, the, on the ATMs outside, you know, you have the keyboard, and they came with a, with a mold of the keyboard, the plastic, and put it on top of the ATM. So you come and you type your, your, your and, and, and they put a fake reader. So they had a reader on top of your, the bank reader that read your card, and then they had, when you put the code, they had on a plastic, then they came and lifted the plastic that was above it, and they had the code that you typed in, in the reader. So now they, all they had to do is create a fake magnetic card with your code, with a tape, and then they have the code. Wow. And it's the most primitive, yeah. I mean, it's really a primitive identity theft or card theft system that I've seen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that is one thing that they, they have done. And now, and I've seen it even in some uh, Duane Reed or Walgreens stores now, where you just <laughs> swipe the card above. Um, yeah, <laughs> when you have that, the, the, it's risky. You, you know, you have the whole uh, um, scanners. You, I, I, there are scanners that I can go behind you or next to your purse and scan your card from the outside. And they have these wallets that protect you from, from those scannings. So clearly a card that can be read by swiping in the air again, makes the life of the customer, and everybody, there's a constant competition to make the life of the consumer easier. The banks want to be more attractive. We have a more sophisticated card, we have a better card, and there's always the, the price for it that, you know, yes, if you swing it in the air, of course the, the risk grows. You were terrific. Thank you so much. We learned 
an enormous amount of information today. It's cybersecurity war. It's a war. Yeah. And we will. The real way to eliminate cybersecurity is to eliminate the war. Excellent. Because it's just a weapon. Maddie, thank you. And thank you for joining us at Starter TV, where innovative thinkers come to share their ideas. I'm Vanessa Tyler. Join us next time.